Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. is a lengthy DAF that begins with a discussion about the halacha that food and drink don't combine to a minimum size to violate the iser of eating and drinking on Yom Kippur. Merle will discuss whether that's and across the board, Allah that everybody agrees to, or it's dependent on a different machokas and halachas tumma. Then tomorrow we'll bring a Mishnah. We'll have our next Mishnah, which will discuss when uh, a person is obligated to bring two korbanos chatos for accidentally violating Yom Kippur, and when just one. Then the Gemara will search at length for the source for a lav, an iser, a los ase, to violate the halachas of Yom Kippur, which are all stated in the positive ase form. So first of all, the Gemara wants to know, we've seen in our last Mishnah, that a bit of food and a bit of liquid do not combine together to one minimum shear. So Gemara has a machokas between two amaraim against two other amaraim, whether or not this is dependent on a machokas. Now, according to Rav Chizda and Rish Lakish, this is dependent on a machokas between Rabbi Shua and the Chachamim and Hilchas Tumba. What's the machokas between Rabbi Shua and the Chachamim and Hilchas Tumba? According to Rabbi Yeshua, if you have two different types of Tumba, they can sometimes combine to one minimum shear. Tame things need to be a minimum size in order to transmit Tumah to something else. According to Rabbi Yeshua, uh, if you have two types of Tumah that have the same shear, they have the same halachos of their sizes, and they also have the same halachos of Tumah, that is, their Tumah makes sense for the same length, then they combine to count towards uh, a minimum size of Toma. Even though they're two different types of Toma, because they have the same halachos, they can combine to the same types of Toma, and they can actually combine to a shear. Now, the Chachamim argue on that, and they say, no, under all circumstances, different types of Toma can combine, even if they are different types of shirim, they have different measures for their shear and different halachos, they can still combine to be one shear of Toma. So now, our Mishnah says, as far as Hachazim Kippur, food and drink, which have different shirim, one is a Kosevis and one is a Malalugmav, do not combine to an issue. So that sounds like Rabbi Yeshua. So that's what Rabbi Chizda and Rabbi Shalker say that this is Rabbi Yeshua, who says that they do not combine, just like in Tumma, they don't combine if they have different halachos. So Gemara says, however, that others uh, argue, Gemara says Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Yochanan disagree, and they say no. Here, even the Rabbanan would agree that they do not combine. What's the reason? In Hilchas Tumma, they combine even if they're different types of Tumma because they're the same Isser, they're all Tumma. So all Tumma, it all adds up to Tumma, whatever it is. However, as far as Hachaz Yom Kippur, the question is, does it bring a person out of his Eno? Does it bring a person a sense of comfort? And eating a little bit and drinking a little bit do not combine to, together bring a person a sense of comfort. You have to either have a minimum amount of eating, food, or a minimum amount of drink. Okay, this takes us to our next Mishnah, which discusses the Lachos of when a person is obligated to bring two kabanos chatos for violating the halachas of Yom Kippur. Now, generally, the rule is, is that if you forget that it's Yom Kippur, or if you forget that something's us on Yom Kippur, and you violate Yom Kippur, you have to bring a carbon chatos for that violation. Now, if you have two of the same iser that were both performed in the same period of forgetfulness, that is, you did not remember between the two isurim, as long as it's the same iser, you only have to bring one carbon chatos for both of them. If two separate isurim, then you do have to bring separate carbonos for each of them. So, the Mishnah says, if you ate and you drank, in one period of forgetfulness, that's considered to be one iser. Eating and drinking is one iser, as we've seen earlier. Drinking is part of the eating, it's part of the inoy of eating, and therefore that's only called one iser, and he's only obligated one korban chatas. However, if he ate and he did malach on Yom Kippur, that's two different violations of Yom Kippur. He has to bring two korbanos chatas for that. Now, the mission continues, and it says that if you ate food which is not edible, you drink drinks which are not drinkable, so it's not called eating, it's not called drinking, and you do not violate the halachas of Yom Kippur for that. An example of a drink that cannot be drunk is melted fish fat or fish brine. The Gemara now begins, and the Gemara is searching for the source. Where do we find the psukim that say that there is a lav, that it's forbidden, that it's a mitzvah, slosa say, to violate Yom Kippur in the two types of violations, that is, breaking the five inuyim, uh, breaking the five afflictions, and doing malacha. So what we're looking for is four things. Every iser in the... T- 
Torah has to have a place where it says that it's forbidden. It says you may not do this. And it also has to have a place where it says what the punishment is. So as far as the five inuyim, the, the, the afflictions, we're looking for a place where it says that it's usher to eat, it's usher to drink, and all the other things. It doesn't say that actually anywhere straight out. All it says is, v'inisim is nafshesechem, you should afflict yourself. That's a positive commandment. You should do an affliction, which is strange because it's telling you not to do something. It's telling you not to eat and not to drink and all the other things. But where do we find an indication that it says, do not do it? And where we find a description of the punishment if somebody will violate the five afflictions. And the same thing applies for doing work. Not to do work says says straight out five times. The uh, Torah says, like, sasu kol melacha. And where do you find that a person gets kares for doing work as well? So first of all, the Gemara discusses why does the Torah not say straight out, do not do uh, any of the five things that take away from the afflictions. Do not eat, do not drink. Why does it say that? So the Gemara nor the Gemara says, Rish Lakish says, there was no possible way to write it as an Isser. The Torah cannot say straight out, do not do something uh, as part of teaching you what the five afflictions are. Why? Because what could it say? If it would say, don't eat, so then we would use this the shear, we would use the size of eating. The Torah says not to do an act called eating. An act called eating is a kizayas, but that's not what it is. Well, the correct size is not to imbibe an amount that takes off the feeling of afflictedness. So it couldn't say, do not eat. So what then could it say? It could have said, don't afflict yourself. Well, don't afflict yourself would mean you should eat, so that's wrong. So maybe you could say, he shomer pen to una. Guard yourself lest you not afflict yourself. Versus that would be two lavin. He shomer and pen is two lavin. That would be two isurim. We don't want to have two isurim. It's only supposed to be one. So Gmer says, okay, maybe it could have said, he shomer um, be mitzvah's inoi. Guard yourself for the mitzvah's inoi. That is only one lav. Uh, so Gemara says, but that wouldn't be a lav, that would be an assay, because it says, guard the mitzvah's assay of doing inoi, that's whenever you have the term hishamer, it's a lav, only if it's telling you not to do something, but here it's telling you to guard the positive commandment of doing the mitzvah of inoi, so that would be an assay, not a lav. Gemara says, though, but it could have said, al tasor min inoi, do not turn away from the affliction. Gemara says, that's takakasha, that it could have said, that would have been a good way of expressing it. The Gemara now brings a couple of sources to show that there really is a love, there is a hinted love that we could learn through drashos to violate any of the Inuyim on Yom Kippur. There is a mitzvah's losa say. And the Gemara first brings a very lengthy bracelet which discusses a number of other sources before it gets around to that topic. So the bracelet begins by discussing is there a mitzvah of Tosefes Yom Kippurim? That is to keep a bit of the lachas of Yom Kippur before Yom Kippur and after Yom Kippur. Is that a mitzvah dairaisa? And does that have kares? So we have a few issues. First of all, the Isser Malacha, does that apply before and after Yom Kippur for Karis? Does it apply before and after Yom Kippur for an Isser? And the Enoi, does it apply before and after Yom Kippur for Karis? And before and after Yom Kippur for the Isser? These are four things we're going to search for. That's the Abraisa's first mission. And the Abraisa quotes three psukim that all use the term Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh. Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh, only on the day of Yom Kippur itself is there an Isser Deraisa and a Lav that uh, has Karis on it. And three out of the four things. Which are the three out of the four? So the Bryce brings Psukim Masalah. So that shows that the Isser Kares for violating the Isser Malacha is only on Yom Kippur itself, not before and after. Next Pasuk that it brings um, is it says, V'inizim is nafsho sechem chal malacha lo sasu. That actually the Bryce says would be uh, indeterminate, that wouldn't show us either way. But we do have a uh, passage that says, That says that you have to have the Inoi, but it's only that there's Kares. Only only on the day of Yom Kippur itself is there even but not before and not after. Now, as far as that there's no love, before and after. So as far as Malacha, it says, There's, a, there's only an Iser Malacha Daraisa on Etzamayomaze, not before and not after. How do you know that there's no Iser Inui? So Gemara says, well, if there's no Iser Malacha, before and after Yom Kippur, there's not going to be an Iser Inui, because Iser Malacha is a much more common thing. Iser Malacha you have by Shabbos and Yom Tov. Um, not just by Yom Kippur. So if it still does not appear, even though it's so common, it's so widespread that it appears by Shabbos and Yom Kippur, still it's only on the Etzama Yom Zev Yom Kippur, not before, not after, not on the spread to Sefes time, then the Inu, which only applies to Yom Kippur, not anywhere else, is for sure not going to apply before and after. 
So now the Gemara is going to look for the actual lap. And the Brayza continues and it says as follows. It says that the Einish, uh, the fact that you get Kares for violating the Iser of Yom Kippur, for, for violating Yom Kippur, that is written clearly both by doing Melacha on Yom Kippur and by violating the Inui. So Gemara says, why do you have to write both of them? You could just write it by one. Isn't it obvious that the Enoi is a much weaker limud than the Eser Malacha? Eser Malacha applies by all other Yemen Tovim and Shabbosas as well. So if you just write that this car is by Enoi, I would know certainly this car is by the Eser Malacha. You don't have to write it by the Eser Malacha. So it's extra. Why is it extra? To teach you a hekish, a connection between the Eser Malacha and the Enoi. Just like the Eser Malacha, it doesn't just say the punishment. It also spells out a lot of don't do malacha. The same thing applies to the Inoi. The Inoi is also, there's a punishment of Karis, and it's also implying don't do malacha. Gemara says the problem with that is, is that it's not necessarily clear that if I would have just said that there's Karis by Inoi, I would have known through Kavachomer that there's also Karis by Yisr Malacha, because there is a sense in which the Inoi is worse than the Yisr Malacha, and that's because the Yisr Malacha has exceptions. The Yisr Malacha has a Terim. You're allowed to violate certain Malachas as part of the Avoda in Yom Kippur. The Inoi has no exceptions whatsoever. So therefore, the Inoi is in a sense stronger. So if we just say that there's Karis by the Inoi, I would not know it to the Yisr Malacha. I would not know that there's Karis by the Yisr Malacha. So says, okay, great, I'll grant that. So just tell me then that there's kares by the Iser Malach, and then I'll know that the Ine, which is stronger, has no exceptions, for sure has kares, and again, it's extra, and again, the extra statement is to teach me the connection between the two, and therefore, just like there is a love by Iser Malach, there's also a love by the Ine. So we're going to say, yeah, but the, the problem is, is that your first statement also is true, that in a sense the Isra Malacha is stronger, and in a sense the Inu is stronger, because Isra Malacha does apply all, by, all over by every Shabbos and every Yom Tov. So therefore neither of them is stronger, and I can't use either of them. So Mar says, no, so there's a different Hekish. The Hekish is from the fact that both have the word Etzem. They both say Etzem and Yom Azev, that links it too. And therefore I could say, just like there is a love by Isra, by Isra Malacha, there's a love by violating the Inu as well. And Mar says, but again, you have to have an extra Pusik for that. You cannot say a Hekish, Without an extra pasuk, if there's a pircha, if there's a way to show that one of them is stronger than the other, and we already show that one is stronger than the other, clearly we've shown that the Inui is both stronger and weaker, in a sense, than the Eser Malacha. So Gemara says there is an extra pasuk, and the extra um, pasuk is as follows. The Eser Malacha is listed five times. The five times are as follows. For the day of Yom Kippur and for the night of Yom Kippur, to teach that it's usher and to teach that there's kares for both of them, that's four. And the fifth one is extra to connect the Isra Malacha and the Inoi, and to again teach me once and for all that just like there is a lav for the Isra Kares, just like there's a lav for the Isra Kares of the Isra Malacha, there's also a lav for the Isra Kares of the Inoi. That's the Gemara's first approach based on the spicer to show where you find the lav to teach a lav for the Enoi of Yom Kippur. Now the Gemara brings other sources, and the first one comes from Tani Debe Rabbi Shmuel. They say the source is actually from the word Enoi, which appears in the sugya of rape. The Pesukim describing an Isra of rape says, Advarash or Enos, Eshes Reyeyu. And here it's also called Enoi. So the two words Enoi link the two discussions. And just like there, there is a lav and an onish. There is a specified Isser and the punishment that you get here also for Yom Kippur. The Eno of Yom Kippur, there's a Lav and there's an Onish. Mar brings another source that is connected to Shabbos of Bereshis. Yom Kippur is called Shabbos Shabboson. Bereshis is called Shabbos Shabboson. Just like the Torah, when it first describes the mitzvah of Shabbos, gives a Lav. And in Onish, Yom Kippur also has a lav and an onish. The Gemara says that Rav Papa says that Yom Kippur itself is a Shabbos. You don't have to connect it to Shabbos. It's called Tish Besu Shabbat Chem. And therefore, it also has a lav and a Enoi, a, a lav and a onish, a lav and a kares, just like Shabbos does. The Gemara says now, Rav, I, I understand why Rav Papa didn't say it's linked to Shabbos Brachos. He wanted to show in the Sugi of Yom Kippur itself. But the first opinion, who's Rav Acha Yaakov, why didn't he say, like Rav Papa, that uh, Yom Kippur itself is called a Shabbos. So the Gemara says he uses the Pasuk of Tish B'Su Shabbat Chem on Yom Kippur to teach you something else. What does he use it for? So the Gemara first quotes the Pasuk in full, which strangely seems to refer to Yom Kippur in regards to the ninth of the month of Tishrei and not the tenth of the month of uh, Tishrei. And this is what it says. It says, Shabbos Shabbos and Hilachem, Yenisim Esnaf Shabbos Should oppress yourself, it's a day of rest. 
Betisha lachodesh be'erev from the ninth in the evening, meaning the evening following the ninth of Tishrei. Me'erev at erev from that evening till the next evening. Tish besu shabbatchem, you should rest your Shabbos. So that's where you you have the words tish besu shabbatchem. So he learns as follows. He says the Torah calls it says fast starts betisha, but also says it starts be'erev. So which is it? Does it start during the day? Does it start when it's already dark? Obviously, it's teaching you somewhere in between. You're supposed to start a little bit early. You're supposed to start uh, just before the darkness begins, just before the tenth of Tishrei begins. And this teaches us that there's a mitzvah of Tosefes Yom Kippur to start the Iser uh, Malacha and the Enoi a little bit early. Now, how do you know that that applies also ending Yom Kippur, that you should also add on a little bit, you should stretch it a little bit later? So that's because it says, Ba'erev, Me'erev, Ba'erev. It connects the two evenings, the beginning of Yom Kippur and the end of Yom Kippur. And how do you know that it applies to all other Yom Tovim and Shabbos as well, that there's a mitzvah daraisa of Tosefes? So that's because it says, Tish Pesu Shabbatchem, this applies by all other Yom Tovim and Shabbos as well. So therefore, that's what this um, Pasuk is for, and it could not be used to give us the source of the love of Yom Kippur. So now the Gemara says, now hold on a second, we had a brisa, the long brisa before, that said that there is no Mitzvah the rise of Tosefes Yom Kippur. So what's he going to do with this pasuk here, which clearly indicates that there is? Where it says he uses this pasuk for something else. It discusses a betisha lachodesh be'erev. It's not teaching you anything about Tosefes Yom Kippur. I'm adding on to Yom Kippur. It's saying that it's referring to Yom Kippur as being on the ninth to teach us somebody who eats and drinks on the ninth of Tishrei on erev Yom Kippur. It's as same mitzvah as if he's actually fasting on Yom Kippur itself on the tenth of Tishrei. Okay, that concludes that discussion. The Gemara now refers back to our Mishnah where it said that if somebody eats or drinks things that are not edible, he does not have to bring a carbon chatas for that. That is not violating the Iser, but he have it to the extent that he has to bring a carbon chatas. The Gemara discusses a number of foods and drinks that are not edible. So the Gemara says, Rava says, chewing uh, raw peppercorns is not uh, is not going to be mechaev somebody to bring a carbon chatas, and eating, chewing raw ginger is also not going to be mechaev somebody to bring a carbon chatas. These two things are not uh, edible. So Gemara has a cash on each of these. Gemara has a source to show that they are considered food. Far as the pepper, the Gemara brings a statement from Rabbi Meir, who says, on the Pasuk where the Torah is describing Arla. So the Torah says, When you come to Eretz you saw you plant any fruit, uh, any tree of a fruit, varaltam arlaso is perio, and you should keep the halachas of arla about its fruit. So Gemara says, Rabbi Meir says the words eats machal here are extra. Obviously, it's talking about a fruit tree because it talks about its fruit. So I just have to say, you plant a fruit tree and eats machal, a tree of eating. So this is to teach you that we're referring to even a tree that you could actually eat the tree. The taste of the tree and the fruit are the same. What plant has the same taste in its fruit and in its tree? That is pepper kernels. So you see that the mitzvah of Arla does apply to pepper kernels. And if somebody eats them, he will violate the iser. They are chayv and Arla. They are considered to be food, even when they're raw. And not only that, but to show you that Eretz is not missing anything because it even grows these fruits. So you see that pepper is considered food. So Gemara says there's two types. There's fresh, moist pepper, and then there's dried pepper. Dried is used only for spices. If somebody eats dried, that's not going to violate any issue. It doesn't count as eating, and that's what we're referring to here about the Sugavim Kipper. And Rabbi Meir was talking about when it's moist and it's fresh. As far as ginger, the Gemara calls Rav Nachman, who says somebody eats Himlisa, which is made from a hundui, so that's, uh, that is okay, and you make a bracha on it of very priyadama. So that shows that it is a, uh, this thing is actually food, it's edible, and this thing is made from ginger, it's pretty much pure ginger. So how could we say that eating ginger is not considered eating? So Gemara says, again, we're referring to when it's moist and fresh, and they're referring to when it's dried, uh, well, we're referring to when it's dried, and therefore it's not edible, it's just a spice, and they're referring to when it's moist and fresh. And then brings a price about other foods, and says you eat reeds, uh, reed leaves, you're not chayev for that, that doesn't count as food, but if you eat sprouts of a vine, a grapevine, you are chayev for that, that is considered food. When is sprouts of a vine considered food? So Yitzchak Magdala said, only if it grew between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And Avkana said, as long as it grew within 30 days before Yom Kippur. Mar brings a price, that's exactly like of Yitzchak Magdala. Somebody who eats leaves of a reed uh, is not chayev a carbon. Somebody who eats uh, grapevine shoots is chayev, and that's only if they grew between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. 
Now, as far as drinking things, so our Mishnah had said that fish brine or melted fish fats does not count as a normal drink, and therefore you're not over for that. Says the Gemara that Rebbe held that vinegar vinegar is not food. If you drink vinegar, uh, uh, sorry, Rebbe said that vinegar is food, and if you drink vinegar, you violate, you have to bring a carbon you violate the Yisrovium Kippur. Gemara said that Rav Gidl Bar Menashe of Beiri did not rush, Paskin not like him. He gave a shear, and he said that the halacha was not like Rebbe. So people went ahead and they mixed vinegar into water and they drank a lot of it on Yom Kippur. So he was very upset. He said, that's not what I said. First of all, I, I, I didn't say you're allowed to drink it. I said, if you do drink it, you don't have to drink it from Chatos. I never said that it's mutter to go drink it. Second of all, I just said if you drink a little bit. I didn't say you could go drink a lot. And third, I didn't say you can mix it with water. So he was very upset that they took his halacha out of context and told them. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.